Welcome to the fifth video in the marketing strategy course. This is campaign design, fifth out of eight. Let's have a quick recap of where we've got so far with our marketing strategy. We start out by saying, what is our strategic objective? Where do we want to go? Where do we want to be? If you don't know where you want to go, how can you possibly plan a route to get there? We have validated our overall concept with the circuit, the five elements, brand, product, proposition, problem, and market, um, so that we know that we actually have something worth taking to market. If we don't, we review and revise. Then in the last video, we looked at upgrading. So we tweaked and improved and enlarged and increased um, and those circuit elements wherever we could to come up with a overall concept or proposition for the market that's really, really compelling and really stands out as different. So now it's time to look at how we're going to get there. How are we going to get to our objective? And this absolutely means, this is a theme that you have heard already during the course and you're going to hear it again. You've got to narrow your options. There are so many channels for reaching people. There are so many tactics, so many different tools out there that it's absolutely impossible to master them all um, or master more than a few. It's, it's impossible even to try them all. There are so many. This is one of my favorite quotes. This goes all the way back to Save the Pixel 2008. A man who chases two rabbits will not catch either one. It's an old Russian proverb. And I can't stress this enough. No matter what we are doing, you are likely to have more success by doing one thing and mastering it and really learning from it than trying multiple things. Okay, we'll be talking about that a lot more as we go on with this video, but we've got loads to cover, so I'm just gonna crack on. The toolkit available to marketers today looks kind of like this. Right, you, you you simply there are so many things that you could that you can try that it's just utterly, totally confusing, and we feel a pressure that we need to you know, you know try everything in order to you know to see what works, and you can't do it. Bottom line, you cannot do it. So you've got to narrow your options. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to tell the truth. Okay, now the truth is what you choose it to be, as we've already seen, right? But the situation is that you have the business that you have, um, you have the strategic objective that you have declared and chosen for yourself, right? These are the facts. You have the resources that are available to you. You have your strengths and your weaknesses, right? And you know what your competition is, right? So these are like the threats out there. These are the facts. You have designed your circuit. This is your overall concept that you're going to take to market. You have chosen those elements and that those are the facts. This is what we're working with, right? So with that in mind, you have a shape. It's like a key fitting a lock, right? So you now have the shape of what you want to do what you want to sell, you know who you're going to sell it to, and there will be one or in fact many, many different forms of campaign that can fit that. So we're looking for a fit. And what you're taking to market, your circuit is pretty much unique. There's, in fact, it really should be, right? But there's going to be no one else out there with the same thing. So do not for a minute let somebody tell you this is a strategy that always works, so do this. You need to find a strategy that fits your facts as you have um, discovered and chosen them. Okay. So, the nature of that concept, as we said, the shape of it will help you to determine what tactics may or may not be appropriate. So, really what we are doing right now is we have to look at the tools that are available to us, right? As somebody said to me the other day, you know, too many toppings ruins a pizza. 
It's absolutely true, right? You can't put everything on there. You can't use everything because you end up with something that has no distinction, but certainly no edge and no chance of success. So the circuit is a brilliant model for understanding your whole offer. That's what it's there for. And we have a couple more models, um, and this is pretty much it, that we're going to use to help plan and build a campaign out. We have to talk about edge again, and the importance, the vital importance, of being on your edge when it comes to choosing the tools and tactics and channels and methods that are going to be right for your campaign. Okay, So we know, we've talked about this before, you can be behind your edge, you can live in the past, you can be retrospective. Or you can be ahead of your edge, which is chaotic, right? But on your edge is the place where the past and the present meet. So in terms of uh, campaign design, to be behind your edge is to focus only on what used to work. Right? So if you, if you only go by what other people have said works in the past, then you know, you, you are limiting yourself to what may work better for you. Likewise, if you are ahead of your edge, you know, you're in that kind of high risk, chaotic state, then that's try everything. So that's when you, you think, oh, I, you know, I need to try this, I need to try that, I need to try the other. I've got, um, I've had a client recently that has tried pay-per-click, uh, telephone marketing, trade shows, a whole list of different things and burned through their funding in a few months flat with very very little to show for it okay you can't try everything you really can't in the middle being on your edge is the meeting point of those things it's what works what works now what works today for you and it's kind of weird because you don't know for sure what works. So you have to try things, but you can't try everything. You can draw on what has worked in the past for yourself or for other people, but you shouldn't base all your decisions on that. Right? So it's, it's this creative film between the past and the future, between death and decay and chaos. Right? What works now? So what we are doing is we are using common sense and intelligence to discern with this pattern, this structure, design, this shape of an objective and of the thing I want to take to market. What do we think rationally, logically, or even gut instinct what do we think is likely to work now and you can try things and you should try things if you're not trying anything then you're behind the edge you're you're in the past you're too safe and you know safe is now risky risky is now safe okay try and think like the roman god janus the roman god janus was the god of doorways and beginnings and journeys and stuff like that and he's usually depicted like this with two faces one face is looking to the past, one face is looking to the future, right? So we need to appreciate what has worked in the past, absolutely. We're going to learn from the successes and the failures and mistakes from the past. And we should also be looking to the future because that's where we get inspiration for what might be working now, or what could work now, what could work next, right? And if you're going to create something new that's right for now that's right for your market that they're waiting for you you can only pull that in from the future so lots and lots to cover today um here are the two new models that we're going to be looking at one is the awareness ladder now this has come from um, my book convert which came out in 2011 so we're now over six years ago okay so the awareness ladder is a model for understanding where your prospects are and specifically where they are in their journey towards buying from you right and 
remember buying could mean products, services or ideas or whatever it, it is that you want to convince them of what however you want to convert them which means changing their state right so it's not just financial transactions where are your prospects in the journey and it's also a model for the kind of logical cognitive steps that they have to go through in order to get to that point of saying yes to you and we'll go over that if you've read convert you'll understand this already the second model is the five campaign phases um, so wherever they are in this they may already be familiar with your product or they may be just you know sitting at home eating their dinner not thinking about anything right wherever they are on that path there are there are five things that you have to do these are the steps that you can do in order to get them from where they are now to saying yes okay so two models one is where are they and how much of the journey is there for them to go on the second one is what can we do to take them on that journey so let's quickly review the awareness ladder as I said this is uh, published in convert back in 2011 and it was also you know stolen from uh, Eugene Schwartz's book breakthrough advertising well adapted and amended from that um, so we have various steps on the ladder step zero it's step zero for a reason you know it's that and this is all in the context of problem and solution right so they are literally not aware of a problem they're sitting at, sitting at home minding their own business they may have suffered from you know backache they may have background anxiety over money how they're going to pay the bills and whatever but they are not consciously thinking oh i have a problem okay the next step is step one so they become aware of a problem it's like oh I need to do this right but they haven't yet researched solutions or they don't know solutions now sometimes people may skip over step one you know if you're sitting at home and then you haven't got a headache and then suddenly you get a headache it's like oh I've got a headache now we all know that there are solutions for headaches several you know, most people will think oh, I'll just reach and, you know, pop a tablet. So you'd skip over step one, go straight to step two. You're aware that solutions exist. Okay. You're aware of one or more possible solutions to the problem that you face. Step three is they are also aware of your solution. Step four, they're aware of the benefits of your solution to them. Right, so they've learned something about it and they are interested and start to become conscious that your solution may be appropriate for their problem. Step five is they have got to the point where they're convinced that your solution could solve their problem and it is probably worth the price that you ask. And finally, step six, when they've actually bought, okay, so or, say, or said yes so seven steps really and everybody starts at some point on that ladder with regard to any kind of transaction that we may make okay and um, you have to go through all the remaining steps the higher steps in the ladder uh, in order to get to the end you know you have to become aware of your of the solution that you buy obviously and then you have to become aware of its benefits and then become convinced before you buy. It's just plain logic. All we're doing here is mapping out common sense and reality. So what can we learn from the awareness ladder? Well, there's, there's a lot um, that, that we can get out of it, in, depending on, the, on the, the context, depending on your own situation. But generally, um, generally, we recommend that you should focus on the biggest step. So where's the bulge? Right? Where are most people who could be buying from you, what step are they at? And you'll quite often find it's step zero, one, or two. If they don't know about your solution yet, which is step three, they're either not aware of their problem, which is very often a big market, um, they're aware of the problem but not aware of solutions, or they are aware of solutions but not aware of yours yet. The, it's very likely, unless you're a very well-known brand or have a really small market that you've already 
kind of saturated, that most people will be in one of those earlier steps. Okay, so we should be focusing our marketing on the most likely steps where most people are going to be. Okay, so if um, if everybody already knows that there are multiple options to any kind of problem, like you know headaches, for example, you don't need to you know address the you don't need to teach them that there are other options for headaches. They already know that. You can take that as read. So you can skip straight on to step two. So we use different language and different methods for marketing to people depending on what step they're at. Okay. You have to meet them where they are on the path. This is an incredibly powerful metaphor that I find really useful. So they are at a point on the path. Your job is to go and meet them where they are take them by the arm and walk with them to the end of the journey. So you have to take the steps that you need to take. You need to talk to them and tell them the things that you need to say they need to hear in order for them to progress up the remaining steps of the awareness ladder. Okay, Meet them where they are and walk the journey with them. Don't miss bits out. And we've got a tool to help you with that in a bit. So think, how long is the journey? Sometimes it's a case of, you know, you've got a headache, try this technique and your headache will be gone. And that, that's almost the, the complete thing. That's an extremely short sales cycle, effective, effectively. Um, and with some other products or services, the sales cycle could be hours, days, weeks or months even before you can complete that process. So... What's the fact? What is the truth of the situation? How long is the journey between where they are now and where you want them to go? We found this um, in the last few years when in the, the kind of web design, post web design sector, um, we've been thinking, right, we are marketing strategists, we are digital marketers, we are local digital marketers. There's, there's a whole range of ways in which people are starting to you know move away from web design to you know thinking more about what they actually deliver but we found you know certainly a few years ago that if your market is thinking web design then you still have to you have to meet them where they are you can't stand half a mile up the road and shout and expect them and say, marketing strategists over here, you know, they're there, stood there thinking, oh, I, need a, I need a website, right? Now, they may need marketing strategy, okay? Then thinking, I need a website, doesn't make them wrong. That is, they are where they are, okay? So it's your job as a marketer to meet them at that point. You have to go to them. You can't expect them to come to you. This is... A pretty obvious thing, but it's a, it's a, a pothole or mistake that you have to make sure you don't fall into. If you've got a step zero market, so people are not aware of the problem, they are not typing it in to Google or any other search engine that may be available. Okay, so you know even if they could be doing something better, right? Did you you could do your small business accounts in a fraction of the time and save yourself six hours a, a year or whatever, right? If they're not thinking, oh, I'm spending too long doing my accounts, then, you know, you there's no point using SEO or AdWords because if they're not typing that into Google, you can't serve up your content to them. So what you have to do, if somebody's at step zero, you have to take your message to them because they're not going to type it in and ask for it, right? So that means you've got to advertise to them. You've got to get your message in front of that target market because they're not thinking about that thing. It's like the old newspaper ad, do you make these mistakes in English? That's a step zero ad, right? Because no one's sitting there thinking, hey, I wonder what mistakes I make in English, you know? They're, they're, not, they're not thinking that. But your ad makes them aware of a problem. Hey, do you make me these mistakes in English? 
Oh, well, maybe I do, you know? There you go. And also, another little insight is from step zero, sorry, from step two onwards. So, step two is they are aware of the problem and they are aware, they are aware that solutions exist, but they're not aware of yours yet because that's step three. But step two, particularly, you can also use competitors' keywords to steal SEO or pay per click traffic. So, for example, people might be typing in alternatives to competitor or does competitor product work things like that and you are actually perfectly well allowed to do comparisons with what you offer and what they offer right even if it's not a commercial competitor it might be a diy kind of solution okay um you can use terms that they might be looking for to indicate that they are researching competitors because they want to find the right solution. At step two, you haven't chosen a solution yet, okay? Um, because we always have to assume that these are the people who are going to buy from you because we don't sell to the people who aren't going to buy from you, by definition. Okay, so <clears throat> I've shown this before. This is the, the Gen Plus homepage. I think this is an absolutely excellent uh, website. And it's a good example of meeting your prospect where they are. Okay, so these people, the target market aren't thinking, right? They're not conscious that they they want peace of mind. They do want peace of mind, but that's not what they're thinking about. They're thinking, hey, the generate, you know, what happens if we get another big storm like last year, a big freeze, and the you know the the electric goes off and whatever the pipes freeze. Um, what's going to happen, right? So, although the brilliance of this homepage is the insight that that came from the interview process, the insight that these people are actually in the the Gen Plus are actually in the peace of mind selling business, not the generator selling business. Okay, even taking that into account, you still have to meet them where they are, right? So they may have typed in. Um, home generator Ulster, right? Or home generator Dutchess County, for example, okay? So you you still have to meet them where they are and then present them. You could, you could, this is walking with them down the road, okay? So then the headline, you deserve the peace of mind that comes with an automatic standby generator, is you talking them along the journey as you walk together. So the awareness ladder is the first of the new tools that we'll be using to plan your campaign. The second one is the campaign phases. These are outreach or target. These are just names that, that I've chosen for two distinct methods of reaching your target market, okay? And this is what the rest of today's video is gonna be all about, all right? So that's the first step. You've got to find these people first, okay? And now part of the circuit review process should have been when you're talking about your market, do we know where they are? You know, do they congregate in any one place? If they don't, and if you can't think how you can find these people other than putting a TV ad on every single channel, um, then you may need to go back to the drawing board. So you should already have an idea about know where they are and you've probably got multiple options for channels of how to reach them okay so that's the first one the second one could be capture now this doesn't always happen but nearly always happens and um, particularly when we're talking about online marketing it also happens in traditional um, marketing as well for example you know it used to get a lot of uh, tear off and fill in mail-in vouchers in newspapers that people would put their name and address on and mail it in in order to get something back. What that means is that they are trading their contact information for whatever it is that's being offered. And that's exactly the same as we do today with, uh, you know, clickbait, um, whatever it's called, the ethical bribe type of thing, where you say, you know, put in your email address and I'll immediately send you your free PDF or access to the video, whatever like that. It makes a lot of sense to capture people's contact information so that you can then control when you market to them directly in the future. That's direct response marketing. 
but we're not going to talk about all these things today. Third one is nurture. You need to. Th this is really you know the, the walking the path, right? Um, there's a lot of things that you can and should do to get that to them to the point of hey here's right, so first of all I understand your problem. Um, I understand that there are options out there. Yeah, solutions exist. Here's ours and here's how it's different and here's how it'll help you. And just imagine how great your life will be when you've done this. And then you know, here's my offer, how about it, call to action. Okay, That's the nurturing phase, taking them right up to the end of close, which is your call to action and uh, make it easy for them to buy. And then finally, continuity. After they've bought, don't lose interest, don't walk away. Very important, okay? These are the five phases. Find them, get their contact information if possible, take them through, educate them everything they need to know in order to know that your thing is right for them if it is. Make the close, very important. And after you've done that, what happens next, okay? And when you, marketing strategy means that you've planned for all of these things, okay? nearly always capture but not absolutely always i mean one example might be um so basically if you've got if you know that you will never need to market to that individual ever again then you don't need the contact information otherwise you probably do okay this is a shot of a spreadsheet now you can access this spreadsheet you go to benhunt.com slash al2 it'll redirect you to google drive this is a visual model for the seven steps on the awareness ladder along the top from step zero to step six and along the bottom we've got the phases outreach target capture nurture close continuity and kind of how they map together the top and bottom don't matter as much as what's in the middle what's in the middle is the step-by-step -step process that you should at least consider when planning out your campaign okay we're not going to go through it all today because the rest of the videos will be working through this okay so today we're talking about outreach and targeting how you're going to get in touch with people um, all of this stuff pretty much happens after you've done that after you've uh, you know got in contact with them okay um, but this is just a quick preview to say this is a logical map of any journey, really pretty much you know, any sales campaign. And this is something that you can really write your sales copy all around. Okay, so let's move on to the main course of today. We're gonna to be looking at outreach and targeting um, in open source marketing. These are two broad ways in which you can find and get in contact with, get some message in front of your market. And we're gonna explain how these two broad approaches differ. And you need to be thinking about, okay, is my business gonna be using more outreach, more targeting? Very well could be both, or one leading to the other. So. Let's run over some basics first of all. What does your market know? What do they want? What do they expect next? What are they actually looking for? And where do they congregate? Okay, so what we're doing now is we are digging in a little bit to try and understand who your target audience is. There's no point um, assuming they know something if they don't know it. There's no point trying to teach them something they already know, because that make you look stupid. Um, and, and what do they expect? You know, what are they actually looking for? You, you know, great marketing should occur to you as, wow, how did you, you know, you really understand my problem. You really understand my situation. And that is the ideal first step, you know, to, um, to start the relationship on. What are they looking for? What are they asking? And really importantly, where the hell are they? Where do they congregate? They must congregate somewhere. Is it particular groups? Is it a particular search that they type into a search engine, right? You know, what, what ties this group of people together? 
how can we contact them? It might be in the real world, it might be online. So we'll run through a few examples of the different channels to do with outreach or to do with targeting. Okay, so let's run through some of these. And this is by no means a comprehensive list, right? Open source marketing um, is a long-term project that aims to build a comprehensive list and aims to explain and research and analyze the, the conditions at which any of these particular things may be appropriate. Okay, we're going to touch on some of the main ones today, but this is not a comprehensive list because there are always new channels. I'm not going to mention Pinterest today. I'm not going to mention Etsy. I'm not going to, there's thousands of channels out there and we can't analyze them all. So what we have to remember from all of this is, here's the truth of the situation. Does this look like it will fit? All right, and you have to decide. Okay. So in outreach, outreach is basically putting your, your brand, your message out there into the world in a passive way, right? Whereas targeting is specifically trying to put your message in front of particular people and asking them to take action. So it's much more direct, okay? So uh, the outreach is, is very yin and targeting is, is the yang version. So in outreach, brand awareness advertising and PR, right? This is how you increase awareness of what you're doing without a specific offer. Um, whereas on the targeting side, direct response advertising is saying, do you make these mistakes? Fill in this now and we will send you a solution. You see the difference? On the outreach side, you've got like content marketing where you put out blog posts, videos, whatever for, to you know around a general interest to help people generally to build up um, your profile uh, to build up links and social shares and all that kind of stuff whereas direct mail you know is comes from the direct response uh, field where you send people a letter and say fill this back in and send it back okay email list building this is generally you know increasing the reach of your business Whereas list rental, it's not your list. So you, the list rental is where you would go to a, a partner and say, hey, I understand you've got an email list that fits this profile. Please can we send out this offer to them and you know strike a deal with that person. In outreach, generally SEO is more of an outreach type of thing um, because it's fuzzy, right? It's, it's difficult to... Um, target specific people at a specific time. You can't really turn it on or off, right? On the other hand, you've got pay-per-click or pay-per-action, which is when you only pay when something actually happens on the other end, but we'll generally talk about pay-per-click, um, which you can switch on or off, very specific. You know, you can be targeting the same keywords, but pay-per-click, you've got way more control over it. On outreach, you've got social organic, which could be building up your Facebook followers, building up a Facebook group, Twitter followers, all that kind of stuff, LinkedIn, um, just generally increasing your profile, increasing your reach. On the other hand, you've got social paid, which is say, I'm gonna invest $5 to push this post in front of this many people because I want them to see this post at this particular time. So you can start to get a feel of the, uh, the difference between the two. Let's go into a little bit more detail. Outreach is generally slow and targeting is generally fast. Okay, And in fact, I tend to think about slow methods versus fast methods. It's quite an easy way to think about it rather than outreach and targeting. By the same token, slow things tend to be longer term and fast things tend to be short-lived and immediate. Okay, With outreach, you generally own the channel. That's not always the case. Sometimes you're in rented property, like a Facebook uh, page, Facebook group. Facebook can switch you off at any time. And of course, you know, if you really mess up with SEO, then Google can, you know, send you to the badlands as, as well. But generally, you have a lot more ownership over the channel, whereas targeting tends to be pay to play. 
With outreach, you've got less direct control. And with targeting methods, you, you have a lot more control, right? But remember, there are pluses and you know positives and negatives to, to either side. So it's, it's uh, more of a case of what's right for your business, what's right for your particular campaign. Because there's no one that's better than the other. Both are good, right? Um, Outreach tends to have low measurability because it's fuzzy, right? It's, it's, it's web-like. You can't control this thing. You put stuff out there and you trust that it will come back because it can happen seasons later. With targeting methods, tends to be really high measurability. And we're going to look at a bunch of examples of each of these um, in the rest of the video. The metaphor farming versus hunting I find very meaningful to me. So in Paleolithic, Paleolithic times, right, um, this is hunter-gatherers. This is when human beings were hunter-gatherers. And what that meant was, if you don't go out hunting, you're, you're not going to eat. right? And there are still hunter-gatherer uh, communities on the planet. Okay, Compare that to the Neolithic period, when what we did was we started to say well instead of going out and picking berries and finding grains and hunting animals and stuff like that could we farm them instead you know so that's when people started to domesticate crops and also domesticate animals so they would instead of going out and hunting the cows or pigs they would catch the cows or pigs or whatever and they'd put them in an enclosure and they would care for them and protect them with domesticated dogs and to protect them and, and all kinds of things. What some people think that what that meant was that we were able to get uh, so many more calories because we were controlling, managing the situation, right? But so hunter gathering is targeting. It's like, you know, you stop doing it, the money stops coming in. Whereas the more kind of farming agricultural lifestyle takes more maybe more effort right and it's over a longer period of time but the results come for a long period of time so you you know you plant your beans your beans grow you eat most of your beans you keep some beans to plant again next year and you next year you have more beans okay but it's a slow process but it's an incremental process and then of course you could fast forward to the modern day where nothing really makes much sense. I think both the other lifestyles are quite appealing. Um, yeah, the metaphor breaks down at that point. Okay, so our job here is to understand enough about the different options that we've got for outreach targeting, how we're gonna reach our target market. We need to understand enough so that we can say, all right, all of these ones, we know that doesn't apply to us. These things could, and we should try two or three of them, okay? And we should put effort into it. This is our old friend, the 80-20 curve, okay? Which says that 80% of your results will come from 20% of your effort, right? And 80% of your effort, the bottom of the curve, will produce poor results, basically. Now. What does this mean for campaign design in marketing strategy? It means don't try everything again, right? Stop me if I'm repeating myself. Don't try everything because it's, it's almost as though the results that you get will follow this kind of timeline. As long as you're not doing something that's completely wrong for your business. If you invest in mastering email marketing, right? Really learn how to get, uh, how to write fantastic emails with a great story that gets engagement and people love to read and look forward to opening. And you learn about your audience and you learn what they like and what they respond to and what they don't respond to. Then eventually you'll probably get a ramp up in performance, okay? You also need to, you know, know what kind of people you want to be getting onto your list so that you're not you know, shouting at people who aren't interested. But you, know, you, you almost have to go through a period of learning. For pay-per-click, this is particularly true. You should expect to lose money on pay-per-click 
for the first few weeks at least, okay? Um, and maybe not necessarily lose money because you can start very specific and be more careful, but you know, it's certainly viable to plan to lose money with pay-per-click because what you're doing with that is you are actually buying intelligence. You are putting something out there in a rapid form, a rapid way, that's targeting, right? Because you're paying, you pay to play with targeting. Um, but what you're doing is you're buying the market intelligence. Now, your results will come later in the process once you have you know, broken through that kind of break-even barrier. Okay, and that's when you'll get your big results. But if you try a bit of pay-per-click, you may as well just burn your money, right? You try a bit of SEO, pointless. What's the point of doing enough SEO to get onto page three for a term? No point whatsoever, right? If you're gonna do SEO, you have to be looking at those top three places on the first page, really. Um, and this goes really for anything that you do. Don't do a little bit of conversion optimization. Don't do a little bit of anything, right? If you try and be a jack of all trades, master of none, you are guaranteed to fail. Okay, so that's the bad news. Don't try stuff. Not to put it in another, you know, other words from Master Yoda. Try not. Do or do not. There is no try. Okay, so this isn't about trying stuff. Yes, you can test stuff, but you can't try everything. Try a few things that you've got really good reason to think could be effective for you. So in the last bit, what I want to do is start to talk through some of the main um, outreach and targeting channels that are available to you so that you start, and this isn't really a point of we need to start making decisions about these things necessarily, because what I'm trying to get you to do now is to be conscious of how different tools and channels and methods have a different style, a different character, a different shape, so that you can decide for yourself which ones are right. Because, and there are going to be channels out there that may be appropriate for you that I don't even know about, never mind cover on this video. So, let's dive in. Now, I've got these little symbols, I've got leaf or I've got a target, okay? So, one's for outreach, which is your slow, organic farming type of marketing, and the targeting is your fast, pay-to-play, quick results, short-term marketing. It's also worth mentioning, by the way, that targeting can um, feed into your longer-term business as well. Right? You should, if you are going to pay money to reach people, you should try and get their contact details so that they go onto your email list, which is, you know, slow marketing, right? So these things can work together. They're not by any means mutually exclusive. And there are things like advertising that can be either or both. So advertising can be slow if you're talking about brand awareness, or it can be fast if you're talking about, you know, uh, offer must end Monday, last few in stock, buy now. Right? One is you know, um, direct response, as in we specifically want you to do something. The other, it has no specific outcome it's a softer more general outcome we want you to be thinking about us we want you to be aware of generally what we do so it very much depends on the intent so you need to be thinking well you know with my campaign what am i looking for am i looking for a long term um you know building my market up generally or am i looking to you know get those dollars coming in as quickly as i can advertising always costs money Right? Even if you're using it with outreach, then it always costs money. Another thing you might consider is guerrilla or viral brand building, if you're, particularly if you're on a low budget. Because it is possible to get, the, get similar or better results than you can get from advertising. So you know, advertising could be anything from banner ads, pay-per-click ads, to print, to outdoor, point of sale, you know, all these kind of plethora of ways in which you can advertise, but viral uh, marketing can produce great results. This is obviously an absolute classic. This is the Will It Blend, the original video. If you haven't seen it, which is unlikely, look it up, the Will It Blend original one. So these guys, um, 
just to repeat the story if you, if you don't know it, uh, queued up for when the first iPhone came out. And what they are is a they make kitchen equipment. Specifically, they make this blender, which they say is the most powerful blender there is. So they stood in line, got one of the very first iPhones on the, the very, very first day that they came out, and they put it in a blender. And they destroyed it to smithereens to show how powerful their blender was. Um, and this was in something like 2007, so 10 years ago. This specific video here has had 12 and a half million views. Now, compare this to a TV ad, you know, where you want to get a 90 second commercial in front of 12 and a half million people. How much do you think you would have to pay for that? And this is, by the way, 12 and a half million people who aren't, you know, sitting there trying to figure out what to watch next or, you know, they're not sitting there just stuffing chips into their mouth. These are 12 and a half million people who have chosen to watch this video. Another thing I'd like to bring to your attention as well <clears throat> is the likes, the thumbs up and the thumbs down off YouTube with this. I have 12 and a half million people. You've got 30,000 people who have liked it, which is what you would expect for that many views. You've also got more than 10% of that number who dislike it. And remember how we've been talking about polarizing, you know? Do something that takes a stand and gets people to have some kind of emotional response, even if it's negative. A negative emotional response still means that, you know, you've been noticed, you've been thought about. You might also get shared, right? If people hate what you say and what you're doing, it could still actually mean success for you. So don't don't shy away from upsetting people or pissing them off or dis, you know getting them to dislike. You know, down thumbs are not necessarily a bad thing. So a little note about virality. If you're thinking about guerrilla marketing, and, and by the way, you know, the, the whole point to this is, and I, I've worked in agencies before where we've had really dull ass brands coming up to us and saying, we'd like you to run a viral campaign. It's like, oh, how do you do viral? It's so painful. You know, when you, when you come up with a brand that is meaningless, that has no personality, stands for absolutely nothing, to say, we want you to do viral. Well, you can't just do viral, right? Stuff goes viral if it deserves to go viral because, looking back to the circuit, looking back to upgrading, you've got something that's great. You've got a product that's great. You, you are great. You are useful. You know your target market. You love your target market. You can't wait to solve their problem. That's, that's what really works. That's the kind of thing that goes viral because that's the kind of thing that people care about. Okay, you can't, you can't make something boring go viral. <coughs> so, excuse me. This is our old friend, the 80-20 curve again. Now with virality, what do we mean by virality? <coughs> excuse me. So we asked the question, for each person person that sees this message, how on average, how many other people are they gonna like are they gonna share that message with? Now, if it's less than one, then mathematically that message will die out. Unless you keep pushing it, unless you keep paying for people to see it. Okay? And that means that you're gonna have to keep throwing money in the top of this machine. If on average the typical person shares it with more than one person, then you have virality. Now, the ex how much more than one that is will go up in a logarithmic curve like the 80-20 curve. So if, you know, for everyone who sees this, shares it with three more people, bang, you've got something that's going to explode. Okay, so that's how you need to think about what does viral mean. It simply means this. Okay, a few different types of advertising, we've mentioned them before. Direct response, do you want people to do something in, re in response to seeing this ad? Or do you just want them to, you know, take the information with them? Which is awareness building, right? You need to decide. The traditional methods, don't ignore these. 
TV advertising can be affordable, radio, outdoor, print. Um, the, the more people there are competing for a particular channel, the higher the cost of that channel is likely to be. So, you know, always be thinking, well, what isn't everyone else doing right now? Or wasn't, what isn't everyone else doing yet? Affiliate partnership advertising is great. If you've got, for example, a, a website or a magazine that you know your target market reads that, then approach the publisher to say, I've got this offer for this, whatever it may be. And I'd like to offer your readers a discount on the thing. And whatever I make, I will split 50-50 with you. All right? They'll use a distinct code, etc. Okay? That's affiliate partnership. And you know, I'm surprised how few people do this. I get loads and loads of requests for people who want to publish their blog or blogs on behalf of their customers on, on my website. And I always say no because it would just dilute what my website says. Um, I get almost nobody approaching me saying, hey, you've got a market of, you know, however many people who are interested in web design and marketing. Here's, here's an offer. How would you like to do this? I think I've had one of those in the last few months. Um, this, is, this is really good. But remember, so this is definitely uh, targeting because you're going to pay. You're going to pay for that success but you're paying out of your success, okay? Uh, sponsorship is another one. You know, you can put your name on something else, something that's likely to be seen by your target market. Obviously, pay-per-click, pay-per-action. And on the social side, you've got boosted posts. Lots of different types of advertising. Mainly, these are targeting, okay? Really, you've got to be a big brand with deep pockets to engage in paying for advertising in order to build awareness, right? If you think about that, you know, you need to know, if you're a small business, you need to know that if I'm going to spend $1,000 on this, I want to know I'm going to get more than $1,000 back and in a hurry. You can't, you can't afford to do general brand awareness building advertising over a period of time in the hope that the stuff will trickle through in a year or two's time or even a month or two. Content marketing is slow marketing. That's outreach. It's unpredictable. It's slow. You know, you don't always know what's going to work, but it is very long term. The, the, um, the results can come over a significant period of time. And the key to this is edge. The key to this is that you, you don't want to publish content that's so far out there that people go, that's whack, I don't even get it. You don't want to publish content where people go, oh, that again. You know, I know we know all about that. What you want to be doing is publishing content that is almost at the front of people's minds, almost on the tip of their tongue. And I've got a great example of this. I published a post in, I guess, beginning of, yeah, Christmas 2008 called the Web 2.0 Design Style Guide. In fact, that isn't exactly true. I wrote one called Current Style in Web Design before, um, and, and this is a ex perfect example of Edge, right? Follow me on this. The Current Style in Web Design post, which is from like two, 2006 or 2007, was getting loads and loads of traffic. Like I was getting six, 7,000 visits a day to Web Design from scratch. And, um, and I, I looked on Google Analytics, and I looked at the search terms that people were typing in because Google used to be a lot more open with that stuff and there were loads of people typing in web 2.0 design and I thought what the hell is that right what does this mean and this was around the time that the term web 2.0 was coming out but um, what happened was that people started adopting that term to also to describe the kind of visual style that was going on at the same time but I wasn't thinking in those terms but there were enough people who were that link to it using those uh, keywords. And current styling web design was ranking number one on Google for web 2.0 design. So what I then did was I, I saw that and I jumped on it and I wrote an article called web 2.0 design style guide. And as you can see from this, these are the actual Google Analytics stats by week or month by month um, since 2008. So this is almost a decade. Uh, it's had 1.7 million page views, 
1.36 million people have read that page, on average spending three, nearly four minutes uh, looking at that stuff. The value of that could be absolutely incredible. But the key to it was that I put together, just, what I did was I just put down, it's like, this is what I'm seeing at the moment. This is what I'm seeing works, and this is why I think it works. And people looked at that and they went, wow, that's really helpful. And they linked to it, right? That's content marketing. It, it really is just a case of publish what you want to read almost. Okay, content marketing can build authority and it can build traffic. It can include blog posts and infographics and video marketing. So you can use YouTube, a, a great way to get on page one of Google as well using YouTube. Um, books and eBooks and also interviews. I, I think interviews is great. So you know, you've got a particular topic that you want to talk about, tell people about, phone up your heroes. You know, who are the people that you would love to be sitting around a table talking about that stuff with, right? Get in touch with those people and say, please, could you give me an hour of your time over Skype or whatever, Zoom or GoToMeeting? Because um, I'd love to ask you and explore about your work, your insights and stuff. And you'd be amazed how many people say yes. They get exposure for their message and whatever they're doing, whatever they're selling, you get kick-ass content. Okay, having your own email list. This is an outreach thing. Yes, you can use it specifically for targeting, right? So you can have a mailing list. So I can send out a message to, you know, everyone in the US on my list who has opened an email about this or that or the other. So you can use it for quite specific targeting with a specific message. But as a, a strategy, should we or should we not be building, starting and building our own email list? Well, the answer is nearly always yes, you should. It's nearly always a good thing. Email lists are uh, wonderful. But don't let that, uh, don't ignore social as well. Social could be catching up with it. Um, you know, and this is just really because of the way that things go. You know, it used to be a case that you'd feel special when you got an email and uh, you know now you know who who out there doesn't get enough email I think we would all say we get more than we need okay so it takes a lot to cut through the noise on that like I said before the only reason not to capture people's contact information or particularly email is if you're in a competitive single transaction market where you really need to focus people's attention on the sale rather than, oh, one that you put in your email address. So you don't want to be offering them too many things on the same page. I heard this statistic a few years ago. I don't know if it's still true. It may be more or less now. But what I, what I heard was that research showed that the average name on the average email mailing list was worth 10 pounds, about $13 in today's money, it used to be about $16, um, globally. Okay, so for every name you can capture, you should expect to get about $13 to $15 back from that name over time. And the great thing about uh, any method of capture actually, but particularly on, on email, is that you get to control the conversation. You get to decide when that person gets the message. right? So you can actually push your messages out to them. And that's the great thing. Always remember that people need a good reason to trade their contact information, right? Don't expect to put, keep updated, or, you know, get our news, or just join our newsletter. If, if you've got a website that says, you know, join our newsletter on it, think of something else, for goodness sake. Because we all have enough email already, right? We don't need any more email. Give me a reason to do it, right? Offer me something. I'm, I'm going to send you a preview of my new book. I'll send you a free video series. I give away five ebooks off Web Design from Scratch in return for um, an email address, and it works. Email list rental is the targeting version of the same thing. This is the, the fast money version, right? So this is when, 
you get a partner who has an email list and you make a trade with them so that you can send your message out to their email list. It's a good way to get a large and targeted audience fast. Obviously, size depends on the size of the mailing list. But because it's targeting, you're going to have to pay. So be prepared to pay that list owner either a one-time fee or more likely an affiliate fee. So for how many people respond, and you'll quite often find that um, you know they will recommend you as well. And you'll maybe do a, a series of emails. And synergy is the key. This is incredibly important. Um, so your what you're offering and your brand should be a natural fit for that market. Right, so you hope that the list owner understands who is on the list. And you also want to know, you know, how responsive is the list? How, what is the general open rate? What is the general click-through rate? You know, what are they into? What kind of offers do they respond to? So you need to know all of that stuff before you commit your money. SEO, we've already touched on. SEO, I believe, is an outreach um, tool. It's possible to, there, there are people saying you can use SEO in a targeting kind of fast money context. There are people who will say to you, you give me $5,000 and I will you know, get you to this position for this keyword and you will get this much traffic within three months or six months. And there are tools that claim to predict that. The problem is that most of the time you will be buying into black hat techniques and the risk there is that black hat techniques can be switched off and nullified by Google and other search engines um, as soon as they're discovered, right? If they leave any kind of fingerprint, Google has got very smart people out there who are trying to, you know, prevent people from gaming the system so that they produce, so they can continue to deliver the most relevant and the best content in response to your search. Okay. Um, yeah, don't let that put you off. SEO can be great, but generally what we're thinking about SEO now is content marketing, um, getting great content out there, and almost don't worry about, don't get too hung up on, on measuring the, the response because the response is likely to come over time and it's, it's going to be fuzzy. It's almost outside of your control. What is in your control is the quality of the stuff that you publish. Done well. As we've seen, SEO can deliver a huge payoff. My Web 2.0 Design Style Guide was specifically designed to get to number one for that search term. Okay, and It probably still is, although the search term has dropped off because no one's talking about Web 2.0 anymore. Think about what the search engines want. Google's job is in to take the query that you type in and to give you the 10 or so best and most relevant uh, results for that search term, okay? So they want to give you the best, most relevant content. If you're in the business of trying to get your content to the top of Google, the secret is write the best and most relevant content, okay? Obviously, you've got to seed it. You've got to get the ball rolling, right? But good content will get links, and content that gets links naturally will rank better. It will also get social shares. Social shares help you rank. It will get good engagement, you know. If you've got Google Analytics running on your site, Google knows how long people are spending reading that page. They'll know how far they scroll on that page. Right? They, they understand engagement. So make content that people want to engage with. It's not rocket science. And always remember, SEO, like AdWords, does not apply to step zero markets. You invest in SEO, you're wasting your time. Public relations, I think, is kind of king, PR, basically getting your message out there. I've, for a long time, I've been thinking that public relations is SEO the next generation. It's SEO grown up, right? So you're not in the business. It used to be kind of, SEO used to be about link building, okay? But that's very kind of manual. I think that PR, along with viral marketing, is about the most powerful tool that you've got available, okay? But remember, it's slow. I mean, it may it, you may get fast results, but they're kind of outside of your control. You can't switch it on and off. You can make your best effort, 
but you don't know when the results are going to come back in. Right? The people who blended the iPhone didn't know you know, exact, they couldn't predict what the result of that was going to be, but I'm sure they had a, a pretty good idea. Like gardening, I, I love my gardening metaphors. There's, you know, a, a saying in gardening where you say, don't feed your plants, feed your soil and the soil feeds your plants. Now, this is what PR is like. PR is about getting your message out to the world in a way that, that, that strikes a chord. You know, that resonates with people, that, that fits what they want to, to hear. Um, so you're, you're feeding the soil. You're not directly trying to contact the people. You are getting your message out to uh, news editors or journalists or bloggers or whoever it may be, right? And they will then do something with that, process it, and then, you know, give it on to other people. And that's almost entirely outside your control. The key to it all is to give people a good story to tell, particularly if you're looking at, at news kind of channels, right? Give them a ready-made story with a headline and they'll go, yeah, that's great, my work is done. That's easy, you know, put it straight in. Think news, think what people want to hear. So PR is, is wonderful stuff. And at the bottom line of it all, be remarkable. Do something remarkable. The idea of to blend an iPhone is remarkable, right? The thing that people were just, you know, dying to get their hands on and to, to vandalize it in that way, you know? You've got to agree it's remarkable. Whether it makes you happy or angry, it doesn't matter. It's remarkable. Paper click or paper action is obviously targeting. You <laughs> you pay every time they click, you pay. Um, on the plus side, it's instant. You know, you could, I could set up a pay-per-click ad in five minutes and have it running on Google with traffic coming, right, for the right term, for the right bid price. It's also massively controllable. You can dictate, and you should be dictating, exactly what phrases people type in, and you can say what phrases you don't want it to match for. Um, you can switch it on, you can switch it off, you can do it at different times of day. It's incredibly controllable. <clears throat> um, Perry Marshall is one of the, I, I, I'm not a pay-per-click expert, Perry is one of the world's, you know, most well-known pay-per-click experts. He has a, a rule for pay-per-click, which goes along the lines of, if you can't break even with any kind of campaign using pay-per-click, then it, it, he's saying it's like a sign that your circuit's wrong in, in, in our language, right? Um, there's something wrong with your campaign, basically, is what he's saying. Okay? So, if you think about it, everyone who's out there bidding for keywords, bidding for the same keywords that you're bidding for, right? If they can outbid you, if they can afford to outbid you consistently, um, and they can get the traffic, and they can... Obviously, they must be able to convert that traffic at a profit or else they wouldn't keep bidding for those keywords, right? So you should be able to mix it with them. You should be able to bid, you know, what they are bidding in order to get those clicks. And you should be able to get the conversion rate for the right price, you know, best kind of continuity and later sales and customer value and all that kind of stuff. You should be able to match that because if you aren't, you're behind your competitors in some way. So pay-per-click can actually then be a very useful tool for research, as in, okay, right, Google's told me roughly how many people are actually searching for this term, but if you are active on AdWords, they'll tell you exactly how many people have searched for that term in the month, right? You can use it for testing, you can use it for validation, you can test an idea with it, right, very rapidly, all good stuff, but of course, you pay. And never forget, there's a massive difference, don't, don't lump... Google AdWords, which is, uh, you know, pay-per-click in response to keywords that have been typed in with Facebook pay-per-click. With Facebook pay-per-click, you are, you put out your content the same way that you put your ad on, on Google. Facebook can be obviously much richer content, videos and stuff like that. Um, with Facebook, though, you target people by their profile. You target them, I mean, both will let you target by location, which is great. 
Facebook will target people by gender, age, job title, etc., etc., etc. Lots and lots of different things that you can do. And likes and interests. Right? So if you've got a particular brand, say, well, I want to target people who uh, have said they like that brand, Facebook will let you do that. Google lets you target people. Google knows very little about their profile, but it knows a lot about their intent. Right? So that's how you use the keywords with Google. But they are, although they're both pay per click, they are very different. Group buying. This is we've got a whole page on this on open source marketing. Um, you know, we want to have reports on every kind of um, channel in due course. Uh, so group buying. This is things like you know Groupon and all the various other uh, variations of that. Really a, a good for new businesses. This is targeting. It costs money. You know, Groupon or whoever will take or Living Social will take a cut of you know have however, however well you do so you have to make sure you've got enough profit in it great for new businesses to get off the ground great if you've got a local market right so you want people to be able to travel to you to bring their thing so there's no point you know selling a uh, Thai massage to somebody 100 miles away because they're not going to travel that far for a one hour treatment right it just doesn't happen but so if you meet all these criteria group buying could work out really well for you um Repeat custom. Obviously, you shouldn't be expecting to make any money from that particular uh, campaign or deal. The, you should make your money in repeat custom. So, you know, I've used one for a local barber's. And, uh, you know, the idea is that if I go along, he's, he's not making anything with that 45 minutes that he spends doing my hair and, and beard, right? But what he's banking on is that I have such a good experience that I will go back and pay the full price every few weeks. Okay, Obviously, like I say, you've got to have a high enough profit margin so that you're not actually losing money on every sale. Um, the wrong group buying offer can kill a, a business. Okay, And you have to have that distinctive customer experience that's going to get people coming back. Another really good use for uh, group buying vouchers is if you've got quiet periods either in the week so you know days in the week where people don't tend to come or times of year when people don't tend to come and you can then focus your promotion on just those exact times podcasting is another great outreach tool because you don't know exactly who's listening you don't always know how many people are listening but podcasting can be really really useful it's another way that you can build and grow your own channel that you practically own. This relationship is like a, a one-to-many broadcasting medium. And it's really grown a lot over, over time. It absolutely needs a niche. It needs something, it needs to stand for something, right? Um, another great thing, we've mentioned interviews already. Interviews work brilliantly for podcasts. I've, I've been on a number myself and it's a brilliant way for... Uh, interviewees or guest experts to e expose themselves to a whole new audience. I, I, I don't know how many people have got in touch with me and say, hey, I found you on, you know, the, this copy one or on Ken McCarthy's interview or whatever. Um, great way to get high value content on there. Obviously, you have to remember podcasts are audio only, right? Extremely important. Um, this comes from copy blogger if you want to look it up it's growth of podcasting um, and it, this was done in 2016 but it shows you the growth of listeners and um, active podcasts over time so it's not slowing down anytime soon if anything it's going up so you know, we are looking at a change in um, the media consumption over time it's no longer a case that that people only look to the standard newspapers, nationals, local newspapers, and TV channels. Now, there are so many ways for you to have your own channel. A podcast is one of them. A YouTube channel is another. And, of course, blogs and, and everything else. We are now producers and consumers. Social media groups is another. This is another outreach channel. And by social media, we're generally talking about Facebook, but also LinkedIn. 
I've had friends who have sold uh, the administration of LinkedIn groups for a six-figure sum. Just let that sink in for a second. Now, they built a group around a particular market and sold effectively the control of the group for a six-figure sum. Um, Facebook or LinkedIn group admins can reach a very large audience over time. Um, they can take time to build and usually, usually do. Again, like the podcast, if you take a strong position or you've got a cause, you know, a real rallying thing that people can get behind and want to be part of, then that's you know, a good reason to join a group. Take a look. If you're on Facebook, just go into the groups. Have a look at groups. Look at all the groups that you're a member of and see how many members they've got. And think you know, how much control and influence does the, um, the group owner have of those over the pinned posts and, and other things. So, yeah, really good way. But always remember, um, yeah, you're in rented space. When it's on Facebook, Facebook owns the building. You're only, you know, you're there by their grace. So, you, you know, this can be taken away overnight. And remember also, with Facebook versus LinkedIn, very different. Facebook is non-work me. LinkedIn tends to be work me. Uh, Facebook, we've got a course in um, Facebook local marketing, which analyzes the mode that... Uh, that people tend to be in when you're on Facebook and it, it tends to be you know to do with your other beliefs passions and interests that tend to be outside of work uh, obviously there are work related groups on Facebook as well but it's a lot of other stuff besides so you know think about what's you know does your business um, is it a natural fit is Facebook a natural place to try and engage people, or is it boring, right? Uh, th there are brands that, you know, and I, s I see this all the time, it's like, follow us on Facebook, and I think, why would anybody follow that on Facebook? You know, this is not a brand that people can care about, or really care enough to, to want to know that brand's news. You know, and I, I really wonder how many people, you know, really want to click follow, and have their news feed interrupted with stuff around, you know, their favorite toothpaste. So I don't care how much you love your toothpaste, it's very unlikely that you want to see all their news. <clears throat> I've said a couple of times, uh, don't ignore the old media. Ignore them at your peril. Telephone, direct mail, uh, newspaper ads, and lots of other areas, of, of, of obviously TV advertising. Um, direct marketing by phone and mail can still be extremely effective. One of the reasons for that is that people tend to be focusing on online now, right? They're thinking about podcasts and pay-per-click ads and all this other stuff. Um, in fact, although we think that you know, direct mail used to be a bigger thing and now people are ignoring it, I think it's still going up in volume, right? But... Um, Done right, direct mail can be extraordinarily effective. Remember also that these are both interruptive techniques. If you send a letter to somebody and expect them to open it, they are giving that their focus, right? Particularly if you phone somebody and they give their time to speak to you on the phone, uh, they are giving up their time. So you really need to be careful not to disappoint them. You know, you have to have a good reason to be speaking to them, either in print or on the phone. And you have to be offering them something that's worth their time. You, you need to be clear about that. I've seen this cartoon a few times. <clears throat> it's great and it's very true. It's like 10 years ago, people were like, oh, I've got all this mail. And they go, and AOL pops up, you've got mail. And they go, wee, this is so exciting, this is interesting. And now we've got we're drowning in email absolutely you know more email than we know what to do with but now by other if you get a, a, a letter through the post now and it's handwritten and you know if it, if you if it looks like it's come from a person that is remarkable and this is just the way that things change over time 
But when was the last time you got a handwritten envelope with a with a, a, a personalised thing in it? Right. I I've been speaking to a company in California who actually specialise in um, adding handwritten elements to letters. They have literally hundreds of people who sit there and write the person's name that it's addressed to, and you know they sign the name of the person it's from. They will even take a red pen, I've got a red pen, and highlight sections on the thing that they really want you to see, or take a highlighter and do it and write on, you know, important or whatever. And you know the difference. When you pick this up, and you know that this has come off a printer, but you can tell when stuff is handwritten. And they hand write the envelopes and they, you know, they might put proper stamps on them. Okay? What that means is that these letters get a much higher open rate than other letters and particularly higher open rate than email. Again, we'll be thinking about the difference between a funnel and a pipe, right? A pipe is you are, you are, you've done everything you can do to make sure that your message is going to the right people. It's much better to send out 100 handwritten letters to the exact right people, right, at a cost of what, $50, than to spend $50 splurging out a message to 10,000 people who don't care less about, about your, you know, your message. So yeah, think about it. Let's, let's target soon. Let's target early. Go for the right people as quickly and directly as we can. Trade shows could be cool. Trade shows cost money for sure but it's a good way of identifying where people congregate right and so you know if you, if you think well this is my target market where do they meet a lot of markets have some kind of jamboree somewhere you know several times a year so think well is there a trade show for these people can i actually go and buy a stall and you know literally meet them face to face it costs money, there's no question about that, so you need to be very, very conscious. But, you know, think about uh, telephone sales is an awful, cold calling is, is absolutely awful, trying to get through to the decision maker. It may be that somewhere in the country on one or two days of a year, all those decision makers are in one blooming room. So go and find them, go and meet them, go face to face with them. You've got to have a, a call to action. Um, you've got to have a good reason to collect contact info and a mechanism to collect contact info, right? Um, but yeah, trade shows could be wonderful. It could be that that's all you need to run your business. You know, think about this. It's not about lots and lots of different techniques. It's like if you find one that works, do that. It's the hedgehog principle. Hedgehog does one thing really well and it works for it. It keeps doing it. The fox comes, it rolls up into a ball. So if, if you can get all the contacts and all the prospects you need from one trade show a year or three trade shows, do that. You don't have to do everything that everyone tells you to do. You have to do what works. And that's all we can do is give our best guess right now what's most likely to work because it's a fit. Okay, Networking events. You know, these, these were kind of hot business a few years ago, maybe not so much now, um, but there's still a lot of them around. Meetups can be great. There's network of, networking events or, you know, kind of professional groups meeting in every city on most days and evenings. It's really important to know the group before you go into it. So like, you know, who is this? Is this actually my target market? How many of the people in that room are likely to be in my target market? But again, this could be a way of getting through all those gatekeepers and actually coming face to face with the exact people that you want to meet. You've got to have a great elevator pitch. Elevator pitch is simply, and you'll know this if you've done your circuit, if you've done it right, right? Say, this is the problem that we solve for what market and this is how we do it differently. Okay? It's... It's the five elements of the circuit. This is who we are, you know. We do this, it solves this problem for these people in a unique way. The five elements of the, of the circuit. So, the elevator pitch, the idea is, 
you go into an elevator, someone turns to you and says, hey, you know, uh, I saw you getting coffee, what do you do? And you say, one sentence, this is what we do, this is why we're unique, this is what we're about, this is who our market is, they know it all. In pretty much one sentence. Okay, so that's the elevator pitch. Always think about giving value. And in fact, this is probably a rule that goes throughout a lot of marketing. Always be the first to give and be the last to give. Give value when you're networking. Bring people together. Show them that you care about them. Don't just go in there with a stack of business cards and batter everybody over the head with your message because they're not going to like it. Um, also consider hosting your own events. If there isn't one... I, I know a guy who set up an event for, I think it was specifically for CEOs, right? And it was a breakfast event, and it was something like 90 minutes long, I, th I think, and it was only for CEOs, and that was his, his target market. But he set this up and he invited people, and the, what he realized was that being the leader of a company, being at the top of the pyramid can be quite a lonely place. And just creating this space to bring all these lonely people from the top of their pyramids all into a room together where, could, where they could actually share and exchange stories and give each other support for, you know, for being a CEO. He said that was incredibly valuable for them. And he didn't, almost didn't have to do anything because simply it's a bit like, you know, what we said about um, upgrading your brand. You know, what can you be? to these people be the host of a party. This is literally being the host of a party. So even just by virtue of the fact that he had brought these people together, that gave, that lent a kind of a glow to who he was to them. And he, I think within a few weeks, struck a deal, went into some kind of partnership with a couple of these people in the room and they just, you know, invited him in on that. And it was absolutely perfect and he'd done very little and he'd spent almost nothing what he did was he used his imagination to create a space to invite his absolute perfect target market into watch out for this one thing a lot of networking events can be painful and the way i describe it is it's a barn full of cockerels and no hens it's like everyone's out there wanting to do it to other people but right so everyone's out there wanting to sell and no one's buying, all right? If you find that situation, then it's time to move on to something else, okay? Not many more to go. Speaking engagements, I love speaking engagements. They can be great for building authority, but again, they can be great for getting you front face-to-face -face with the, pe the exact people you want to be face-to-face -face with. So look for those seminars, look for those, um, I mean, trade shows often have seminars and, and stuff on the side. But I, I've spoken at several events, and um, you know the, the 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 companies that are represented there sometimes are quite astonishing. So it's a great place to find congregation. Basically, is what we're just saying. You know, your target market can all turn up in one place. So even if you're not getting paid for this, even if you have to pay for your own flights in the hotel, you know, the the opportunity to get in front of these people could be amazing. You have to understand the rules of the game first. Uh, some uh, speaking events permit you to sell from the stage, others absolutely forbid it. So don't go breaking the rules because they won't be happy with you about that. Right? But go up and give your absolute best content. This is your opportunity not to tell people how great you are, but through the medium of case study. When you've got people sitting there for an hour with their attention fixed on you, Right, that's the attention. That that's your opportunity to show them what you can do so well. And I think this, I mean, I know in my own career, this is the absolute number one best way I've made industry contacts. So when I've been able to make calls and reach out to people, I think pretty much everybody that I've, you know, all the the experts that I've I've interviewed and had on calls and they've contributed to my books and stuff like that. I think probably all of them are either people that I've met face to face at an event like that, or they've been referred to me by somebody I've met at an event like that. 
It's an amazing way to step up into a kind of you know, the, the social group that you want to be part of. So what a ride so far, and we're only looking at how you can reach people. So just to sum it up, what kind of campaign do you need? Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it both? Is it fast that, uh, you know, feeds slow, builds your mailing list, builds your groups? Um, is it slow, builds a list, and then you can campaign out to them in a, in a fast way with targeting? Do you want to maximize your profit in the short term? Or do you want to maximize your audience? You know, what are you, what are you actually about? And again, your strategic objective will help to inform this. This is why we started out with that. What's the longevity of your campaign? Is Are you building something that's going to last years or are you thinking weeks? And, you know, there's no right answer. Either is fine. And finally, who who is your market? What are they looking for? Where are they? What do they want to hear? What can you give to them? And then finally, this is all you have to do. Just, you know, you decide what channels may fit this pattern what works you know if you imagine the letter coming through the post imagine you being on stage presenting to this crowd of people what feels like it's good fit so my my recommendation would be pick a few no more than five kind of channels at this point that you can put your effort into and safely ignore the rest. So that's that's the end. Because this is all part of open source marketing, this is an open source marketing project um, that you know I would invite you to be part of this. I want to continue to interview people who are specialists in one particular channel or method or tactic so that we can really delve into what is the best context? Who should be considering this? And who shouldn't be considering this? Because as we do that over time, we're going to be building up a fantastic resource. So please, you know, go along to opensourcemarketingproject.com slash campaign dash design to learn more. Um, that's where we're going to be building. We are building a comprehensive list of the methods and tactics and techniques and channels that you can be using for any of these particular steps in your campaign. And uh, yeah, if, you, if you've got something to contribute, please do so. Thanks for your time.